You know, astral theology is not astrology. Astrology is one word. Astral theology is totally different. Astrology, well, everybody knows what astrology is, generally speaking. Astro theology is the religion of the stars. Astro, the stars. Theology is the worship of God. So it's the worship of the heavens. The worship of the heavens is called astro theology. Interesting that the word theology comes from a Greek word for God. In Greek, the word God is theo, T-H-E-O, theo, or T-H-E, the. T-H-E in Greek is God, theo. That's why the study of God is called theology, or uh, theo, God rule is theocratic, or the study of, of God is called theology. This is why um, in churches, in the ancient Greek world, there were no churches, there was something called a theater. And it was called the God Show. So one Sunday you would go to the theater. The is God. And theater, well, that's the same idea. You go to a theater, you, you pay money, and you sit down and watch a show. It's called a theater. <laughs> so today we have the same uh, theater, it's called church. You put the money in, you go get a little sandwich or some hot dogs or something, you go in there and sit and watch a show. And you leave the show and you feel very good. You don't know what the hell is going on, but you felt very good. You paid, you lost $30. <laughs> and so it's just a show. And that's why I always say, come on, it's just a show for God's sake. It's like saying the Bible is the greatest story ever told. Yes, it's just a story. Come on. Just a story. It's called astro theology. Theology, the is God in Greek, and ology is the study of. So the study of God is astro theology. Asking these five year old where God is, they'll point straight out God's in heaven. Well, if he's in heaven, that means he's not terrestrial. That means he's extraterrestrial. He's not from here. God is not from Cleveland. <laughs> and uh, I remember a long time ago, Art, Art Linklet, I had a thing called Children Say the Funniest Things, and he had little kids on the interview, and he was asking this little kid, he said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And the kid said, I want to be a, uh, I want to be a missionary, Christian missionary. And he said, oh, that's a wonderful idea. He says, uh, and, and the kid said, yeah, I want to go someplace where they've never heard about God ever, and, to, and you know, and bring the message about God. And he said, well, what a wonderful idea. He said, well, have you ever thought where you'd like to go? He said, yeah, I'd like to start in Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the kid was clever. Uh -huh. But uh, but the point is that astral theology is the study of God in heaven. Well, that's where God is, is in heaven. And when you understand Jesus... The story of Jesus in the New Testament and the Bible, the story of Jesus, the reason why you have so much uh, misunderstanding and so many contradictory stories, every church has a different story. Every church has a different, completely, totally, nobody, there's no two Christians on the earth agree on anything. The reason why is because nobody knows what they're talking about. It's very simple once you understand where the story came from. But that's a whole story in itself. Where did Christianity actually come from? Well, nothing grows out of a out of a, uh, a vacuum. You know, things develop, and then things develop from that, and then things develop from that. Before you know it, things uh, evolve, evolve, and today we got certain. You know, we got a, a Maserati. So, yeah, but one time, it was back in the 1900s, they had a, a Model D Ford. Today they got Maseratis. Yeah, but things, you know, things evolve. And and, and, um, and so a religion evolves. Everything evolves. And, and so, but all I'm saying is that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are actually based on a very ancient story. That's why the Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. It's a story. It's not a collection of historical facts. It's the greatest story ever told because it's an encoded, uh, meta metaphysical encoded story. The Greeks, as I said, 
the Greek word for God is Theo, T-H-E-O, the, T-H-E. Um, gives us our word theater, theocrat, theocracy, T-H-E. And so it was, it was you know, in, in ancient Greek it was called the God Show. It was called a theater. So you go to the show. It's like any other theater. You go to a show, you sit down, you pay money, and uh, they give you some crackers and a cup of tea or something, and you sit and watch a show. And then you leave the show. Well, of course, in Greece, you left the show with something spiritually that you were taught. You were taught by the ancient Greek um, theocrats. You were taught by the ancient teachers of Greece, all these philosophical concepts and ideas about life and the gods and all that. Well, then you learn something from the Greek philosophy. It was very interesting. So it's called the Greek, the, the God Show. Unlike today, when you go to a church today, it's a God Show, but you don't learn nothing. <laughs> you go there for 40 years, and you still know what they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But all you know is, by God, I love the Lord Jesus. And I was there and in church, that's all I, and I love the Lord. Praise the Lord. You say, well, yeah, praise him. Praise the Lord. And you say, but wait a minute, you've been going for that church in 40 years? Yeah, every Sunday. Can you explain to me one thing that you have ever learned in 40 years? No, they don't know. <laughs> you know all they know is Jesus uh, this or Jesus that and the Lord Jesus. That's all they know. That's it. You say what kind of a school would this be if you go to a school for 40 years and come out and you don't know your butt from a hole in the ground? A pretty bad school. Very bad. <laughs> you need to go back and get your money back because they didn't teach you anything. So once you understand that um, religion, all of Western religion, Judaism, Christianity, uh, and Islam are based on astral theology. Astral theology goes back into Sumeria, the ancient Babylonians, Sumerians, Akkadians, the Egyptians, especially the uh, the Hindus, um, Phoenician Canaanites, Sumerians, as I said. Uh, all of those ancient cultures from the prehistoric and ancient world already knew and understood all kinds of stuff that we are just trying to learn today. They knew stuff about our universe and about the stars and about the life in the universe that we don't even begin to uh, understand today. We're trying to still study the Babylonian uh, cuneiform writings and trying to figure out how did they build a pyramid? How did, how did they build all these great temples? And what did these temples mean? And where did these ideas and concepts for uh, building temples and, and all these great uh, pyramids and all this kind of stuff that's all over the world and all cultures off the coast of Japan and the ocean are great temples. Incredibly beautiful temples in the ocean off the coast of Okinawa and and uh, and uh, and off the coast of uh, Florida, as I've said, um, pyramids, huge pyramids sitting out in the ocean floor. Off the coast of Cuba, there were huge uh, temples and all kinds of incredible <clears throat> uh, places under the seas. What in the world is that all about? Well, it tells you that the, uh, basically what it's saying is that there must have been a time a long time ago when civilizations existed on this earth and they, they were dry and then something happened where now those lands sunk down in a great earthquake or whatever just collapsed into caverns, because we know they're caverns on the earth, and maybe because of the weight and because of electric, because of an earthquake or something, uh, on, you know, liquefied the uh, in an earthquake. Sometimes they liquefy ground, and a huge city could just collapse into a big cavern they didn't know was a mile down. But when it collapses, we have sinkholes today. We're all half a city just collapsed and fall into a hole, sinkholes. Well, hell, maybe that's what happened to Atlantis, you know. The Bible it doesn't say that Atlantis was inundated by water from a from a flood. It doesn't say that at all. Uh, you know, when you, when you read about what happened to the world, it says that that uh, for forty days and forty nights. Well, it's been estimated by university studies that rain and the most, most severe possible rain you could have 
would not even begin to cover the earth's surface for 40 days and 40 nights. If you had the terrible rain for 40 days and 40 nights, it probably would cause six or eight foot of water on the earth or in Europe or somewhere, but it's not going to cover Mount Everest, period. It would cause a flash flood somewhere, maybe. Absolutely. A flash flood, horrible, terrible destruction. But uh, covering Mount Everest and covering the whole earth, the globe of the earth, no. No. Not going to happen. No. So what was this whole story about the flood? Well, it, it goes back to, as I said, it goes back to ancient stories coming out of Babylonia, Phoenicia, Cana. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if you ask, as I said, you ask a child, uh, where is God? A child will point up into heaven. Where 10 out of you, 10. Uh-huh. 10 out of 10 kids will do that. Well, yeah. Yep. Well, I ask any ask any adult, do you believe in God? Oh, yes. Well, where is God? I don't know. He's, up, he's in heaven somewhere. Well, if you go out at night, if you go out at night on, uh, on a beautiful night <clears throat> in a desert and look up, you see an incredible sky. What are you looking at? When you're on the desert and you're looking up at the incredible, beautiful stars, what are you actually looking at? What are you looking into? What are you looking at? The universe. That's right. What is another word for that? What's another word for the universe? When you're looking out there, what are you looking into? What's another word for it? The sky? The sky. Okay, what's sure. another word? Outer space. Okay, and what's another word? Um, the heavens? I guess, yeah. Would that be, would that be a, a term that you could use when you're looking into the heavens? That's what, yeah, I think so. Okay. So therefore, where's God? In the heavens. That's right, in the heavens. Outer space. That's right. That's right. Somewhere in the universe. That's right. Therefore, if he's not, if, if he's from, if he's in the heavens then that means God is in heaven. Well, that's what the religion says, God's in heaven. I mean, he's not from Cincinnati, so he's got to be from somewhere. Well, he's <laughs> out there. I hate to tell you this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this very deeply, but if God is from out there, he's extraterrestrial. It means he's not from this earth. Now, if he's born in Alabama, that's different. Now, he's terrestrial. Terrestrial means of the earth. Cleveland. But, yeah, Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> But if he's not from uh, from the earth, then he's extraterrestrial. Well, he so could be. He could be from Earth, but in a different dimension. Well, see, now you're getting into all the philosophies, you know. So I'm my point saying. being is that God is not from the earth. God is from out there, and out there it means he's extraterrestrial, not from here. Um. That being the case, this whole subject of astrotheology, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think we should go into the meat of the subject tonight, because that's going to take a long. T it's going to take quite a bit to discuss astrotheology. So I want to lay the foundations for it tonight. You need to understand that nothing happens on this earth out of a vacuum. Nothing. Life comes from life. Well, you need to realize that uh, stories that we have heard uh, today and are being taught today in schools and colleges and, and uh, churches can be traced back to ancient stories that the ancient peoples heard the same story. So there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. Right. So if you want to talk about ETs and extraterrestrials and UFOs, well, hell, that goes all the way back to Egypt. The pharaohs actually wrote that they saw golden circles in the sky and they flew around and it frightened the pharaohs and they didn't know anything about it and the people in ancient egypt and in hindus said that they saw a silver disc coming over the cities uh you know that's five six thousand years ago so if you want to talk about ufos nothing new there i mean we've been seeing them for six thousand years we don't know what they are we still don't know mm -hmm. you know but it doesn't mean they're not there it just means you don't know what they are no. Correct. You need to appreciate that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all three can be traced back to something called astrotheology, and that's what I want to talk about. 
the beginnings of all world religions, not all world spiritual movements, not like uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, Buddhism is not based on astral theology. That's a, that's a spiritual discipline. But I'm talking about especially the people of the book. The three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are referred to as the people of the book because all three religions require a book. Christians have the Bible, Jews have the Torah and the uh, and all the other books, and of course Islam has um, the um, the holy book of Islam, the Quran. So what I'm saying is this. Let me let me explain to you what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I heard one time on one of my teachers said, when you're giving a lecture, you tell the you tell your audience what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them. And then you explain what it was you told them. <laughs> and if they still don't get it, that's your problem. Then right? they're never going to get it. Right? <laughs> they're never going to get it. Right. But uh, so what I'm going to try and explain to you is the, is the actual beginnings of where Christianity got its concepts. Now, we're not talking about the organizational arrangement called Christianity, the church history. I'm not talking about church history. That's a whole different subject. But I'm talking about the philosophical concepts and ideas that have given birth to what we call Christianity. Because Christianity as a belief system is based on far, far more ancient, uh, ancient systems of philosophy and ancient ideas, which as far as I'm concerned, is a basis for what might be called today a new world religion. We hear a lot of, especially Christians, crying about this new world religion and the new age and all the devil worshiping and the Luciferian devil worshiper and all this, this stuff about the new age. Well, I'm telling you that there is, in fact, a new age religion which is actually the oldest religion on the face of the earth. And I personally believe that this new age religion that the Christians are talking about is the story in the Bible. The Bible is a new age document. And, I mean, we could go into that for hours. I could show you all the, the scriptures on that, showing that the Bible is a new age document. And that I am totally, this is my, Jordan Maxwell saying this, I am totally convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christianity as we have it today is a, is a lost cause. It's a mockery. It's a joke. There's nothing very serious about Christianity anymore. It's a big joke. All you got to do is watch the TVN, TBN, Trinity Broadcasting. If that doesn't give you a laugh, nothing's going to. No, you're it's right. A, it's, a, it's a sick joke. Of these, of these effeminate, goofy, mentally disordered goofballs jumping around, hollering, hooping and hollering, and spitting all over each other, and falling on the stage, and and uh, going into convulsions on the stage, and throwing you know, jackets at each other, and theater. Yeah, it's a theater. It's a god show. Yep. There's nothing spiritual about it. These people are making hundreds of millions of dollars a month. It's a show. And, of course, the scripture said that there would come a day when the entire world would be in the power of the wicked one, you know. So the entire world is now completely lost. They have lost their, they have lost their spirituality. They've lost their connections with the divine. They've lost their money. They've lost their home. They've lost their government. And now they're just losing their minds. It's embarrassing. It's very, very embarrassing. Adults jumping around on stage, spitting and crying and jumping around, and they call that Christianity. <clears throat> and they're so righteous about it. And they're very righteous. Holier than thou, and if you don't love the Lord Jesus, they're going to kill you. Are they really <clears throat> righteous about it, or are they just acting righteous? Well, are the guys in charge, they they know what's up. Oh, of course they do. They're not stupid. Mm-hmm. 
I've sat and talked with the guys. I've talked with these. You know, uh, Jan and Paul Crouch. So there's a there's a there's a real team. Mm -hmm. You know, like Bonnie and Clyde. Yep. <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde, Jan and Paul Crouch. Well, I had a friend who passed away, so I, I can talk about it now. He passed away about four years ago, five years ago now. It was a dear, dear friend, and he he had a PhD, a master's, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was one of the few people who actually had a master's, uh, did his master's uh, work on, I mean, did his doctoral work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wow. And so he was a master on it. So I would sit and talk with him. He, this guy's got a PhD in the, doc, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he lived down in, uh, in uh, Huntington Beach. No, is it Huntington Beach? No, Balboa. Balboa Island. And uh, he was a he had he had gotten his uh, PhD from uh, Claremont School of Theology. Well, Claremont happens to be one of the two universities in America who actually has a full photographic uh, representation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Israel gave two complete photographic, top of the line, clean, crisp photographic reproductions of the entire Dead Sea Scroll find. They gave it to America for safekeeping in case something were to happen in, in Israel with a world war. They did not want the, 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 the Dead Sea Scrolls to be obliter uh, you know, lost forever. So they made two complete sets and gave two of them. I don't know how many more they made, but they made two sets for America. And they're both in California. One is at these uh, at the uh, university in Claremont. Claremont School of Theology has a complete set of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, Doctor, my this doctor friend of mine got his PhD studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he did a, he did a uh, doctoral thesis on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and 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 his his doctoral work was on astrology in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was his doctoral thesis was. Astrology and the Dead Sea Scrolls. No one had ever written about that. They had a little bit. John Allegro had talked about it a little bit, and some of the guys on the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission in Israel talked about it. But generally speaking, there had never been a doctoral thesis done on the Dead Sea Scrolls and astrology. So he did it. And he did it so well, he got his PhD, got his doctorate because of it. Mm -hmm. So the guy was extraordinarily bright and brilliant on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jewish religion, the ancient Hebrew, all of that. And I used to go down to visit him all the time. Uh, and um, I wish I could remember the doctor who was in Long Beach, who was also in the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission. Was a, He was a, down there in, in, Orange, uh, in, uh, uh, in Orange County. But he was also in the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission. I'll think of his name. Um, but anyway... So my friend who was a, uh, who got his Ph.D. on the Dead Sea Scrolls, we would sit for hours and listen to him. And he would explain uh, the Hebrew religion, where it came from, who the Jews were, and who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, and what was really in it that nobody knows. <laughs> but then he told me, he says, and so after I got my doctorate, I started my own church. I incorporated my own church. And it was, it was called the Church of the Americas, I think. I was asked, he was asked to travel all over the world to give lectures on the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. And he said, but after looking at Judaism and studying it and getting a PhD in it, uh, I, became to, I came to the conclusion that the whole entire story of Judaic Christianity is full of bull. <laughs> that's that's what got in a getting a PhD. Did. That's what that's what you get from doing a PhD mm -hmm. and getting a doctorate in theology, because you got to really do your stuff. You got to know what you're talking about, right? Yep. And in order to get your in order to get a PhD in it, well, because this guy was so good, he 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 said after looking at Judaism and Christianity. And a little bit of Islam, he said, but looking at Judaism and Christianity and getting a Ph.D. in Dead Sea Scrolls, I am totally convinced the whole thing is a crock of bowl. <laughs> yeah. The whole thing. Yep. And he says, wow. so 
There are things in the Dead Sea Scrolls that will never be given to the people. Never. They will never be told. What's really in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the church in Israel does not want anyone to know about, and they ain't never going to know. And so he told me, and I feel better about talking about this now that he's gone anyway. He says, so when I left the church, I founded a church and had all kinds of accolades. I mean, I, when I go to his home, he had all these certificates from universities around the world that give him an honorary doctorate here, an honorary doctorate there, and very, very smart guy. And But he unfortunately became a confirmed alcoholic. And uh, I don't think I ever saw him draw a sober breath. He was one of the most decent, kindest, funny, clever, resourceful, and highly intelligent guys you'll ever want to meet. Very interesting to talk to. I mean, my God, he could talk for hours on the ancient different religions of the world, the ancient languages of the world. The guy's got a doctorate in the subject. You know? And so especially you want to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Listen to this guy. <laughs> and he would tell you stuff that was in the Dead Sea Scrolls nobody's ever heard. So he told me, <clears throat> he said, I became so disillusioned with Christianity and Judaism that I decided I, I've had enough. I don't know if I'm an atheist or not, but I don't know what it is I am anymore. I'm through. I'm through with the whole thing because I know too much. I've studied it too much now. And I know too much, so I, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm no longer care about the Jewish religion. I don't care about any of it. So he said, so with that kind of a background, PhDs, uh, sought after all over the world to speak, you know what he ended up doing? Drinking. Absolutely. That's all he was. Just, Says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. He just said, he said, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I have a bottle and uh, and I have a nice home to live in, he did. He come from a family with money. So he had a nice home by the ocean, and it's always a beautiful home. He had a little pier with his boat and everything, and he said, that's it. I just want to stay drunk. I don't even want to see a sober day. And so he told me, and so I said, oh, I have a job. I've got to work every day like anybody else. And I said, well, where do you work? And he said, I work in a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Discount. <laughs> right. So, uh, and I thought that was funny. Here's a PhD and, and doctorate in, in uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, sought after doctor on theology and religion, all these years of background, experience, world traveler, and today, you know, he works as a, a, in a liquor store. That's it. And he said, I, it's like going to heaven. I work at a liquor store. <laughs> Got all the, all the liquor I want. Bring it home. <laughs> it just goes to show you heaven is subjective. That's right. Yeah. So he told me, he says, now as he needs, uh, so he was uh, worked in a liquor store on, uh, not Coronado, uh, not on uh, uh, Balboa Island, but uh, that city that enters to Balboa Island. What is it? Uh, Newport? Newport. Yeah. But he was a dear friend of mine. And uh, we sat for days and hours and hours, talked about theology and religion, etc. And he gave me stacks and stacks of documents that he had been studying, and he just gave it all to me. So, yeah, here it is. There's all the stuff on the Disney Scrolls. Nobody's ever going to know it, but this was my PhD. He says, take it and have it. So I, and I've got like four or five hours of, of interviews with him in private talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and religion and Judaism and everything. But uh, the point of all of this story is, is that when I ask him, well, where do you work? He said, oh, I still work. I have to, I, I, I can't do any, I can't just waste my life away. So I got to have a job, do something. So I work at the liquor store. This way I got all the free liquor I want. Right? And he says, and our best customer who comes in about every two to three weeks our best customer that comes in, they buy cases of 100-proof vodka, 100-proof this, 100-proof that, the best of the best, top-of-the-line booze, but they order it by the cases, four or five cases of this, seven or eight cases of that. It's Paul and Jan Crouch. And he said, Paul and Jan Crouch, they buy more liquor than I could ever conceive that anybody could use. <laughs> he said that they buy cases of, of hard liquor. They're not drinking it. They give it away as presents. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> to the congregation. Right, to the congregation. And he right. said those people are profound alcoholics. 
He said, I've seen him come in here looped and have to have somebody uh, holding, his, uh, holding him up, and he comes in. He's looped to the gills, and he's ordering seven cases of this, seven, eight, eight cases of that. He said, those people drink like there's no tomorrow. But if you understand, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars a month. And there's nothing else to do but drink and build beautiful homes for yourself and buy yachts and build homes and buy properties around the world and drink. Have a good time. It's a disgusting. And he said, these people are to me absolutely disgusting because they don't mind you knowing that they are drunks and they couldn't care less. They're paying, they're paying good money. And he said, my company loves them. The, the liquor store loves them. These people spend a lot of money at the store. He says, me, I don't care. I'll just take the cases out to the truck and put it in their big vans, load up the truck. And he said, Paul and Jan Crouch are alcoholics galore. You have no idea who these people really are and where the money's coming from and what they're really doing. And he said, I've heard all the stories. I, got all, I, I know personally there are bodyguards. The bodyguards come over and get the booze. And I was sit and talk with the bodyguards with Paul and Jan Crouch. And he said, you have no idea in the world what's going on at TBN. But that's another story. Just understand TBN as a bunch of alcoholic, money bankers, money grubbing. Running the show. Running a show. It's called Theater, the God Show. They dance around the stage and make songs and have people coming in, dancing and singing and and talking about the Lord Jesus. And for twenty nine ninety five, no ups and no downs. <laughs> Millions. That and much. The people love it. That's not astro theology. No, no, no. That's that's the modern day. Christianity, but if you're really interested in the in the spiritual foundations on which ancient Christianity was built, not this modern day monstrosity of alcoholics and goofballs, but if you're really interested in the uh, hidden occult or hidden foundations that you've never heard before, where Christianity developed its ideas from. That is an extraordinarily interesting story about the foundations, the philosophical basis for the stories in the New Testament about Jesus. So I have said this before, I'm stating it again. The New Testament story of Jesus is an encoded story. Codes. You know, you've heard a lot about Bible codes, National Geographic and, and the Discovery Channel and History Channel talk about the Bible codes. Well, it's true. There are codes in the Bible. As a matter of fact, in the original Hebrew Bible, I am told by the rabbis that there's at least seven different codes encoded in the old original, not the King James Bible. But in the old ancient Hebrew writings, there's at least seven different codes that the rabbis know about. You don't. They haven't told you. But they're encoded messages in the Old Testament and in the Torah and in some of the other old ancient writings, ancient Hebrew, which are encoded. And the rabbis are taught those codes. So when I hear people talking about Bible codes, I'm saying, yes, that's legitimately a leg legitimate subject. There are codes. The Hebrew, the, the rabbis will tell you there are, in fact, legitimate codes, and they can show you. If you sit down with them, they'll show you. See how these words are lined up? Every other line is the same words. It's a code. It's encoded. Wow. So you're reading it as if it's a history. It's not history. It's an encoded word. It's encoded uh, ideas. Telling you something in secret. The word in, in Latin is occult. Simply means hidden. Hidden from view. So it's like someone who's, you know, it's like that movie, uh, Beautiful Mind, where the guy was blessed with the ability to see codes. And that's why you have code breakers, people who know how to look at the symbols, watch the way things are configured, and see a code in it. It's called pattern recognition, encoding a message. Well, we have that in the military, breaking codes. 
Well, I'm saying that the story of Christianity, of Jesus in the New Testament, is an encoded story. So if you're reading it as history, you don't have it. That's why if you're reading it as history, like all the churches do, you're going to have a totally different interpretation than the next church, and the next church is going to be totally different because everybody's looking at it as a history, and everybody's uh, uh, ignorant, ill-informed, and unread about history. So everybody's got a different view on what Jesus did, or why he did this, and why he did that. And the Catholics say one thing. Jehovah's Witnesses say different. Then the Mormons will tell you something different. But the Pres Presbyterians will tell you something different. But the, but the Baptists will tell you Everybody's got a different story about Jesus. Everybody's got a different reason why he did this and a different reason why he did that. And you can sit all day long and listen to all the different Christian religions, and all of them will tell you everybody else is crazy and we got the truth. And everybody else in town, all the other Christian churches don't know what they're doing. But we have the truth. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, we got the whole truth and everybody else is full of bull. Yeah, but that's what the Mormons said about you. The Mormons said they, they had the whole truth that's and what full of bull. Says. They all say it. Yeah, but the Catholic Church said both of you are full of bull, and they got the truth. Exactly. Everybody, well, but then the Baptist right. said the Catholic Church was full of bull, and they got the truth. Right. Everybody's got the truth. Well, there's only one truth, so who's got it? Well, first of all, nobody's got it. I'll tell you who has the real truth. The ancient Sumerians, the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Phoenician Canaanites, the ancient peoples of the ancient world had the real truth. That's where the temples came from. All of these ancient artifacts and temples and ancient pyramids and all these incredible uh, temples that we find in Egypt. There's where the real truth is. The real truth is you can't build anything like the ancients did because you don't know what they knew. So once you study the ancient foundations of Christianity and a lot that's in Judaism, but I'm only talking about Christianity right now. Once you understand that the story of Christianity and the story of Jesus in the Bible is an encoded metaphor, it's an encoded story. And that's the bottom line. Now, once you understand that, it makes sense. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when I say encoded story. When I was growing up, there was a book kids used to read when little kids called Aesop's Fables. And Aesop's Fables was a book that you would read to children, little kids, four, five, six years old. You would read to them a little book for children called Aesop's Fables. And in this book, it would give you little stories to read to children, but it taught children certain things about morals and ethics and scruples and everything. It would teach a child with a little story. And one of the stories was the, with the famous story, Esau's fable, was the story of the tortoise, the, the race between the tortoise and the rabbit. The very famous old story from hundreds of years ago. So you teach a child and tell the little kid a story about the race between the, the tortoise, the, 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 the turtle, and the rabbit. Well, obviously the rabbit can run faster than the turtle. So the story was that the rabbit ran all the way up to the goal line, and then to be presumptuous and arrogant, he's already there. The race hadn't even started. He's already there. So he lays down under the tree to rest while the tortoise, he hadn't even started yet. So he's already there. But he's not going to cross the goal line yet. doesn't need to. He's got plenty of time. So he relaxes under the tree, and the old tortoise just plugs along. And by the time he gets up to where the rabbit was, the rabbit's sound asleep, he crosses the goal line. And so the, the tortoise, the, uh, the, the turtle, won the race. Which means just because you're fast doesn't mean you're going to win the race. Just because you're wealthy and handsome and got all the money and everything going for you, that doesn't mean anything. You may be in a car accident tomorrow, an auto accident, and die. While some old man who's been working all his life in a little little Mickey Mouse job has got a beautiful family, a beautiful wife and children and grandchildren and many, many friends and has a beautiful home and he lives to be 90 years old and is enjoying life. And you, you died at 30. I mean, you thought you had everything. You didn't have nothing. You were killed in an auto accident. Or you drank yourself, you, you, you overdosed in drugs. So the point being is that um, 
you tell a child a story about the race between the rabbit and the tortoise to show them just because you're fast does not mean you're going to win the race. Just because you're handsome and good-looking or, or wealthy, it doesn't mean you're, you're better than anybody else. Don't presume. Don't presume anything. Because maybe the one person you thought was a nobody, he couldn't do anything, he might end up being president, and he might end up being a wealthy man, and you end up being broke. You don't know what tomorrow brings, so don't be presumptuous. Well, that's called Aesop's fable. That was just one of them. So I'm saying that Christianity, the original story of Christianity, was like Aesop's fable. It's an encoded story. And once you get, once you understand what the players, what Jesus represented, what the apostles represented, what the different players in the Bible, the different stories, and what what happened, once you understand all of these different characters and people in the Bible and the Bible story of Jesus, they represented a symbol. They represented something. And so then you begin to see that the whole story of Jesus is an encoded story right in front of you, and you never saw it. Why? Because you were looking at the story of Jesus in the Bible as history. It's not history. It's a story. That's why the Bible is referred to. The Jesus story in the Bible and the New Testament, the New Testament is referred to in religion as the greatest story ever told. And it is. It is the greatest story ever told. Why? Because it's the oldest story that's ever been told. It is the only story that's ever been told. Therefore, it's the greatest story ever told. It's a story. It's not our oldest collection of facts on the earth. No, it's the greatest story ever told. So then, if you really want to get something from Christianity, you need to understand it's a story. It's an encoded story. And what you have today of the, in the churches is a blasphemous stupidity. Absolutely ludicrous on the face of it, jumping around, taking people's money, ripping them off, uh, spitting on yourself, falling all over the stage, jumping around, ranting and raving about Jesus, as in Jesus that, and you have no idea in the world what you're doing is misleading the people of the world, and that's why <clears throat> there's a story in the Bible and the New Testament where someone comes to Jesus and they have a seed in their hand. <clears throat> and they have a seed and they ask Jesus, what kind of seed is this? And Jesus says to them, it's a metaphor, it's a symbolic story. And so they said to Jesus, this is a seed we found. What kind of a seed is it? And he said, why don't you plant the thing? Why don't you plant it in the earth, water it, and watch what grows. And if a tr if an apple tree grows up, well, then I guess that's what it was, was an apple seed, arrowhead. But if a, if a pear tree grows up, I guess it was a pear seed. Does that make any sense to you? Instead of me guessing what kind of a seed it is, plant the thing and water it. Let's see what comes up. Because there's no better way to tell what kind of a seed it is. Let it grow. You'll find out what it is. If it's got oranges on it, I guess it was an orange seed. <clears throat> Does that make any sense? It makes sense. Okay. So therefore, Jesus went on to say, the Bible says, Jesus went on to say, by their fruits, you shall know them. Therefore, as you go through life, don't listen to what people tell you. Look at what they do. By their fruits, you shall know them. They will tell you, oh, I just love the Lord Jesus, and oh, I'm this, and oh, I'm holy, and oh, I go to church. I don't want to hear all that stuff. What are you really doing? What are you really? Who are you really? What are you really doing? All that drinking on the weekend and screwing around with your, with your neighbor's wife and messing around in government and cheating people and treating people like crap. I mean, really, what are? who are you really? I know all that stuff you tell me about how holy you are and the church you go to and all that. But who are you really? Because by their fruits, you will know them. Okay? Well, that's a good start. By their fruits, you shall know them. 
what is the fruitage of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam on the face of the earth. Think about it. To be able to do a quality show, we need people to listen. So thank you for spreading the word. See you next time.